Thank you so much, Peg. And I was going to start off by saying, I'm sorry, you have to leave Morocco now. <laughs> Um, as the Poet Laureate of Sonoma County, uh, it's my obligation to read you a poem about the fires. Um, I'm going to take you on the worst adventure that we've had, um, but I'm, I'm going to talk about um, this poem was after spending seven days dealing with running shelters and evacuations, I took my kids to the beach so we could breathe the air, and I read Nature by Emerson, and it was probably one of the most beautiful experiences of my life, and this poem came as that. After the seventh night of the Northern California wildfires. For seven nights, there were no stars, only sky muted by smoke. On the first night, the dry bones of the past rattled the eaves of oaks on the hillside. Then, raging hot throated wind stirred and sparked flames until the mountain cracked open red lava heart pouring down. A man or a woman is most alone when he or she looks at the moon stained red, at the hillside glowing hot as a stoked furnace. Every house feels to be a single cell of the same beast, fragile and ignitable. And the days drift on, safety looming off horizon, a far off ship, but so long as we can see far enough, we never tire. So now I'm going to take you to Jack London. Um, Jack London took a cruise with his wife, Charmaine Kittredge London, um, on the snark. They went through the South Seas. Um, they sailed to Hawaii, Tahiti, Samoa, and the Solomon Islands, and they ended on the island of Guadalcanal, where um, Jack got so sick that they had to uh, sail commercially to Sydney, Australia, in return. But um, where on the on the trip, um, what really happened? The ama amazing discovery that happened was that Charmaine Kittredge London realized that she was a writer. Make them float in your mouth. If you want a story, you have to look for it. You have to begin with the idea of seven years. You have to imagine a boat. You have to build it from paper and ideas. You have to sail your leaky boat into hissing lava as it enters the sea. You have to reach your first destination and ride a 75 pound surfboard until you fail all day. You have to watch the plantation workers cleave the sweet fruit with machete again and again until the story you've told yourself begins to stutter and spit. You have to go to Molokai on the 4th of July and see for yourself the small girl who, missing a nose or an arm and covered with sores, wears sequin clothes and joyfully dances. You have to sail on past empty pockets and bank accounts. You have to watch your itinerary dissolve in the water next to the Australian yacht converted for blackbirding. You have to see the machete lines carved into the teak door. You have to lose all of your water and then be blessed with a storm. You have to endure sores the size of baseballs that seep and cling to your calves and thighs. You have to go up river into the luscious green tangle of what is unknown until the flowers emerge, red, hibiscus-like, large enough to contain the whole sunset syrupy sky. You have to find that island, make it float in your mouth. Two more adventures. This one is um, set in Squaw Valley. Has anyone ever gone on the, the hike from the floor of um, um, all the way up to Shirley Lake um, from the floor of the valley? Yeah, and run, you ride the gondola down for free. That's a big reward. It's a really long hike. 
Well, I've dragged my kids up that hike for the last, uh, well, just a lot of Thanksgivings we've done it. And uh, it was a lot of candy. But um, uh, we've had a, a different kind of family journey because I have a son that's, that's different. And so this, this hike became kind of the story of, um, of the journey we've had as a family. And there's one term you need to know, and that's arboglyphs. And they're um, tree carvings. Um, that were made in the bark of aspen trees by shepherds um, uh, who were up in the hills for, for months and wanted to see their loved ones again and again. And on that Shirley Lake hike, you can see arboglyphs. So we always look for them. That was the lure for the children, along with Snickers bars. <laughs> Prayers for arboglyphs. The trail rises from the valley, vein to sky, Sometimes granite bedded, sometimes hushed by pine needles. When we walk it, we walk for hours. We try to remember each turn, each nook, try to find the unmarked way. Blue skies bury us in expectations. The creek that threads us up waxes and wanes between full-bellied summer and the ice of holding its breath. There are days when we walk through the pygmy pines, wind whispering like the waves of a lost sea. We giggle like dryads. Other days, the jagged maws of granite islands swallow us whole until we can no longer find each other, our way, echoes that bend our voices apart. We aren't the first to want to annotate this passage of wilderness. No matter how steep it has become, halfway up, black scar of an arboglyph screams from the curved belly of an aspen tree that we aren't first or alone. God bless the tree that remembers the wound of another's experience. So that when we return to the level valley floor, we hold that carved wilderness in us. Static whisper of aspen leaves, the course we found, the hope like a hawk's scream that pierced us until we carried on. Okay, we're going to end in the town of Pit Hole. And I just want to say, if you, it, it, all the writers in the room, if you discovered a town named Pit Hole, wouldn't you want to write about it? So I was teaching at Clarion University, and I went into Special Collections, and I found they had the history of the oil, oil industry began there. And um, this, uh, I found all these amazing stories, and most of the book is about this. Um, but this is the story of Widow Ricketts, which was one of the only women um, who didn't have to sell herself in order to make money in the town. She, she washed uh, the clothes. And so this is a, a semi-true story. The Ballad of Widow Ricketts. I remember the way the water would reflect the clouds as I pulled the bucket up from the well. 10 hours a day bent washing the mud from each lost heart shirt. Then after I'd finished, how good it felt to sit back in the cool shade beneath, beneath the last hemlock, not yet cut for lumber. Mine was a simple life, not rich, but good enough. There's always washing to be taken in, the hotel linens, the shirts of weary or elated boys, the girls who can't look you in the eye, down on luck or striking it rich, there's always mud and dirt and oil there's always something to wash. That night, I heard the screams first, then the sound of glass bursting, hot rush of air. I ran out into the dark, found Syracuse, Syracuse Hotel engulfed in flame. Just far enough away, a mob gathered in their own fear, 30 or 40 women and men, half clothed, mud and soot streaked. When they saw me, they came back to life running past me to my well like I brought the thought of water to them. In minutes, we formed a fire line, passing buckets, dousing the fire's hunger, body to body, body, hand to hand. By dawn, we were up to our knees in mud and ash, the hotel smoldering, but the surrounding houses spared. 
We unstitched our weary bodies from the line that had held us up. I took a few girls home with me. They didn't have anywhere to go. Set them up with a few blankets and chairs in the parlor before I crumpled into my own bed. It wasn't until noon when I awoke with a tremendous thirst. Light peered in and my face was flushed with its heat. So I took a bucket to the well. What rose to the surface was dark and sticky as the night had survived. Oil, I screamed until the girls came and thirst closed my throat. The well was dry of water, but oil flowed steadily for nine weeks straight. The girls I brought home from the fire now helped me retrieve the oil. We filled every wash basin full, dirty clothes piled in untouched mounds all over the house. By noon, the men had gotten word. They brought barrels and offers to take charge of operations. <laughs> By the second day, seven had proposed. <laughs> we just laughed, took the barrels, and kept on. The men started digging up every other well in town with no luck. Then one day, the oil just stopped. I dropped the bucket down and found only clear blue sky and clouds reflecting back up at me from the dark. It didn't take much to pack up shop. We hitched a wagon, tied on our belongings, and waved goodbye to this oil-sick town. The men were still optimistic. They trailed the wagon on foot, offering last chance proposals. We just urged the horses on, leaving them to their dusty hope and thirst. At the train station, I handed each girl a ticket home and a bit of money. We were a sight, hugging each other on the platform, our lives untying. I looked out of the train window the whole ride home, watched the river wander away from the sharp shale cliffs, clouds carried on its round surface. Thank you.